Hello and welcome to this introduction to open air part one. Uh, there is another part that will be presented during Vitalis also. This is a, a quick introduction. So a little bit about us before we start. Uh, my name is Celia Yuslan I'm um, a registered nurse and informatician and I work at the Western Norway Regional Health Authority and uh, my main job is uh, building and uh, governing archetypes and I also build um, clinical structured functionality uh, on top of our Divs Arena platform. And my name is Erik Sundvall and I work at Karolinska University Hospital as an information architect and both of us have been involved in open air for decades. As the uh, agenda for this first part of this um, open air introduction, we've selected what and why and um, uh, of course starting with what is open air. Um, how open air helps reduce reinterpretation and also we're going into templates, archetypes and forms on a very high level. Um, starting with what is open air. Um, open air is a non-profit organization and also an international community that publishes technical standards for an EHR platform along with clinical models to define the content. And uh, the idea behind it as, is to build a lifelong patient-centric shared health record. Um, and everything OpenHR publishes is publishes either under the Apache 2 or the CC by licenses from Creative Commons. So it's kind of open source. And also since this is a beginner class, EHR stands for Electronic Health Record. Yeah, it's not the same as the uh, traditional um, uh, mega suite um, applications that sometimes also are called EHRs. When we say EHR, we mean only the data uh, part of it, not the full application. And also as part of uh, defining what open air is, it's important to define what it isn't because when in a lot of cases, when you talk about something that's called open something something, people think it's an open source software and open air is not a software, uh, it's a, a set of specifications, but you can make uh, software using it. It can be open source or it can be closed source uh, based on what your requirements are. Um, it's not an app that you can download but there are several tools and components that you can download and use to create um, your application. And of course, it doesn't solve all your problems, but it can be used uh, to cure some of the root course causes of bad health IT. Uh, the key properties of OpenHR is multi-level modeling. So when we model our clinical data, we don't try to uh, mash everything up in a single model. We build it layer by layer. Um, and um, this makes it possible to separate the data definition from the implementation. And it also makes it possible to separate the persistence layer from the application layer. This also helps having the technical parts in one layer where you have normal software implementation there and more of informatics and configuration on top. And OpenHR is good for uh, things like building uh, clinical data repositories based on standards. And these are more or less like uh, clinical databases. They're products where you can push your data into it and then you can query them. But uh, as opposed to traditional relational databases, you can do that using your clinical models. You don't necessarily need to understand all the different tables and so on, the, the different data is stored in. Um, you can use OpenHR for modeling and standardizing the clinical concept models, which we call archetypes. You can use the archetypes to create complex data sets using um, combina combinations of the archetypes. And we call these complex data sets templates. And uh, from the templates, you can generate uh, application um, data schemas, uh, which we call operational templates. And then you can use those to persist clinical data in based on all of those standards. And using something called 
AQL or archetype query language, we can retrieve those clinical data in a predictable way. And you will see examples of this very soon, so don't worry. Yeah. And of course, um, there are a lot of things in health IT that you don't really need open air for because open air um, adds uh, a bit of complexity. And for the really complex problems like clinical data, that is necessary. Uh, but for things that are simple and static, like, for example, demographic data or appointment data in your application, you don't really need open EHR. Uh, it's probably better to use more traditional um, development methods for that. Uh, and of course, also things that are not going to re be reused or are not fit to store in the health record, um, you don't really need to use uh, open EHR for that. So open air is one building block in your entire application building. Yeah. And uh, one way of uh, of looking at this or, or comparing it to other things is to think about Lego. And um, there are about two and a half thousand variants of Lego bricks in production today. And they can all be combined in an infinite number of combinations. And why is it that you can do that? Um, the reason, of course, is that Lego has created um, these very, very specific uh, definitions of uh, how a Lego brick should be constructed in terms of, of course, the material, but also the measurements. So all the little knobs on top have to be 4.8 mill millimeters uh, wide and 1.7 millimeters tall, or else the bricks won't fit to each other. Um, and this is comparable to the Open EHR reference model, which is the technical foundation, and it also defines the uh, very basic building blocks for uh, the content, which will later be added as archetypes, uh, for example, data types and a lot of other things, uh, some, some um, uh, foundational classes and so on. Um, the reference model, it's not quite true that it contains no content, but it contains no clinical content. So all of that will be added later. Uh, and it's normal UML models, so you can implement the reference models in different programming languages like Java or C Sharp or whatever. Um, and going on to archetypes, um, archetypes can be uh, compared to the specific Lego blocks. Uh, which are, of course, created using the uh, reference model. Um, and they are specifications of clinical concepts. They're almost always clinically oriented, so um, the clinicians can recognize the concepts and, um, and uh, use them in a way that feels familiar to them. Um, they're created using an, uh, a thinking called the maximum data set. And the idea behind this is that as opposed to when you're uh, using a more um, sort of um, uh, minimal common data set uh, thinking, when you create something using a maximum data set, um, you uh, allow it to be used in every use case where that uh, concept is, is required uh, because every single uh, requirement is already included, you constrain it to be used in in each um, in each uh, use case instead of uh, having to add stuff to it every time you use it. Archetypes are created, most of them at least, to be reusable uh, for every use case for that particular uh, clinical concept. And of course, we try to standardize archetypes. There will always be archetypes that are local or uh, created for a very specific use case, but um, uh, looking at it from a, a helicopter perspective, we try to create archetypes uh, uh, in a standardized way. So looking at an example, uh, body temperature, if you, um, if you were to, re to um, record body temperature in a very simple way, uh, the element that you would be using the most is this temperature, which contains a number and a unit, uh, for example, Celsius. Uh, but in some use cases, there are other things that you need to record to be able to, um, to interpret this temperature. For example, where was it measured? What kind of device was it measured using? Um, was this person uh, under thermal stress? Were they exposed to the uh, uh, environment? 
uh, where they um, exerting themselves, for example, running on a, on a treadmill or any other thing. Um, so, and of course, in in a lot of uh, use cases, you don't really need to to specify the exertion or thermal stress because it's it's not relevant to to the use case. And in those cases, you um, you constrain out or remove those elements for the archetypes. But for whenever there uh, you have a use case where you actually need that, you you can uh, you can use it without having to redefine it every single time you're using the model. Moving on to templates. Um, and templates uh, are created uh, by combining archetypes and constraining them uh, to, to the use case that you, you have. And templates can be used as data sets for forums, messages, etc. They're usually case specific. Um, and um, another th important thing to point out is that the template is not the user interface. It's the uh, specific uh, data set for, for the use case. Um, and then we move on, of course, to building on top of the, uh, of the templates where you build forms or applications. They define the user interface. And they've, of course, based on the templates, they, you may have uh, terminology sets and uh, very often some program code. Some people um, you do this using uh, low-code form builders. That's uh, part of my day-to-day uh, -day work. Um, but you can also use them, of course, in, in um, uh, programming in a more traditional fashion. Uh, this layer is not standardized by OpenAir, at least yet. Um, but it's, it's, um, I think it's relevant to, to um, include it as, uh, of course, it's, it's a very uh, important part of software development. And if you want to have more information about these things that I've uh, just discussed, you can go to the OpenHR website to find general information about uh, OpenAir and, and about governance. Uh, you can go to the specification site to find the technical stuff. Uh, you can go to uh, the CKM or uh, Clinical Knowledge Manager to find clinical models. And then we have a discourse site for the community. And you can ask questions about anything, both technical, clinical, or yeah, anything you like. And now we'll have a look at a little bit of why. We, this was what we talked about now, but why do you need open air? And what could it be useful for? And one of the things is to reduce reinterpretation. And as long when you're just in one system, you might not see this as a problem. It's when you start connecting things, different specialities or different systems that you discover this. So uh, what can be converted by algorithms? If you can you do some magic here to convert from uh, system A here to system B here, if you want to input information here and use it over here. And this is what we'll look closer at now. If you have an example, here is, again is system A and system B. Uh, and if you have input like this in one system and want to convert it to something like this in the other system, they're almost the same thing. So this is not a very big problem. You can set, tell an engineer to fix this. So as long as you have a budget and people, you can do this. And when you've done the algorithm, then it can run every time. So do the work once and then everything is automatic. First, you have to double check that the birth weight and body weight actually are sensible to convert between each other. Maybe it is one way, but perhaps not the other way and things like that. But once that is checked by an informatician or others knowing the field, you can do this. If the differences are, look like this, so in system A, this uh, hip replacement surgery is described in this way. And in system B, it's described in another way using different uh, terminologies, for example, here, SNOMED CT here and ICD-10 in the other end, and different structure, it's structured with different headings here than over there. And it's very hard to make a safe conversion here between this format and that format. And going the other way is completely impossible because we've got less information here than here. So. This is usually 
not possible to write an algorithm for a computer program. And then you can't tell an engineer to please connect system A and B and make it automatic. Instead, what we're doing is that we have clinicians uh, doing these conversions manually for each patient because a good clinician can understand what it says here and understand the structure over here and convert things like knowing that, okay, in this case, the heartburn here of the patient doesn't make the ASA classification uh, higher and things like that, but that depends on context. And then you've got another kind of difference type three here. If in one system we've selected uh, this six to 10 cigarettes smoked per week. So what should we pick in the other system? Should we pick four to seven or eight to 14? Well, that's impossible to know. So not even a, a good clinician could um, convert this because we've destroyed data in different ways. If you're going to destroy data by aggregating it, then you need to aggregate it in the same way, at least. We've seen lots of problems with this in uh, clinical research registries and this that they use different ways of doing this. So uh, these magic things here, uh, the type one problems, the ones where it's possible to make an algorithm, then you can decide on having an interchange format. This is a classical way of doing uh, um, interoperability. And then we can write clever code here and clever code over here and fix it. But if the problems are of type two and three that we just saw, then you actually need to make the systems here, A and B, more look alike each other on the inside. So that's a very important thing to think of. So what usually happens is that instead of having magic in these boxes, when you have of type two and three, uh, you find that they, these are more or less monsters, that it's impossible to make an algorithm. Uh, maybe you will have uh, uh, consultants and others saying, we'll fix this, but after a while they won't succeed anyway. Uh, so then there are workarounds like this, you print it out and you fax it over and someone else needs to enter it over here to get it into another structure in system B, if it's going to be in system B. If it's more than just reading, then you have the magic here instead of over here. So it's in, in the head of this clinician making the conversion, which we don't want to <laughs> spend clinicians time on. Sometimes you say, well, fax is not modern, we'll send a PDF instead. Um, but actually the same problem remains. If this clinician needs to read the PDF and then reinterpret it and manually enter it again, you have the same problem. Uh, and sometimes you could even remove this person over here and give uh, the man in green here direct access to system A. Uh, and, and that's a little bit faster, a little bit easier. Uh, and for the things that he just needs to get into his head, it's enough. But if you need to use this data in system B, again, you will have to do the conversion manually. So these are problems. So again, repetition here. Type one, the easy ones could be done with normal integration patterns, but type two and type three, you need to <clears throat> do something clever in the systems to make them more look alike each other. So here is where open air comes in. Open air is, and some other times we start seeing some American systems like graphite, CAM models and other things, um, also focusing on this making the system A and system B more equal inside. Uh, and classical uh, interoperability standards usually try to work out a standard for the message in between. And that works fine when it's possible to make the export, I mean, import boxes, but otherwise not. So that's why you see more and more interest in standards that actually work on the inside here, because you, after a while you run into problems here. You, you can't just do the simple use cases and then after a while it gets too complex and you get the clinicians having to re-enter things manually again. Um, if we just take another angle of the things that Celia talked about before, uh, feel free to interrupt me, Celia. Uh, we had the archetypes. Now we look at what it can look like if you're going to use them in practice. So here, uh, you have uh, the archetypes for, for example, airway, breathing, pulse oximetry, blood pressure. This happens to be in Swedish here. Uh, and they are put inside something called a template. 
So when you make a template, you pick some archetypes and you select which data um, fields from the archetype that are valid or are, are useful in this template. And then after having made a template, you can more or less uh, automatically create a form and then spend some time on adjusting the form so that it looks good. But then all the data connections, uh, all the, the logics and structures is already connected. So you don't have to do the like normal program that you make a user interface and then you sit and connect things to this field and that field in the database. It's all done automatically. And the tool here you can see on the if you go back Eric, uh, on the right hand side is uh, the um, uh, archetype designer tool, uh, which you can find on the address in the lower right corner tools of an org. Um, and this is what we use to create uh, archetypes and templates. And then there are, are several different tools to make forms from different vendors. Uh, so in this example, you saw that we had picked some things from the blood pressure. So it could be like this, that maybe it's the ones that are with red here that you want the clinician to enter. And the yellow ones could be things that we've put as defaults. On this clinic, we measure, uh, uh, for example, uh, blood pressure is usually sitting and on clinic B, they usually measure uh, when people are lying down and then you need this extra information, but you don't need to enter it each time because each site could have their own defaults, but it's possible to change. And the clever thing is here that we can get all this stuff stored together. If we're going to mix all these values from different places that you usually want to do in a big health system or with several EHRs, you want this context information, not just in the heads of the users knowing that, well, uh, we usually measure lying down or sitting up. So this makes the data much more reusable. And then the other things that we don't have arrows uh, for, they are just left out in, in this particular uh, template. So here you see an archetype, but when it's used, maybe we just use the yellow and the red ones. And of course, defaults are um, potential pitfalls, um, hmm. <laughs> which you have to you have you have to be careful when you create uh, user interfaces uh, on top of data sets which which have defaults. Uh, so you make it clear that to the clinicians that uh, this is a default that's set, and uh, so they have an opportunity to to change it if they do something that's out of the ordinary. Yep. And then there are tools like this that Cilia is using quite a lot, I think. It's the, yep. the CKM, which is a library of archetypes. And you can, if you happen to know exactly what the template is called, you can use this uh, search box. But if you want to do a, more of a synonyms search and don't know exactly the name of the archetype, then you use the find resources there to, to get more information. And you can, these are often available in many languages. So when you found what you're looking for, you can check if it's available in your language, otherwise you can translate it. Uh, and there's a version history. Of course, uh, you want to capture everything in a maximum data model if you can, but sometimes uh, reality changes and sometimes you've forgotten something. So it's very well-defined version history here, so you can see things. Uh, and uh, you can see the versions here also, and if they're published or not, the little green tick there says that uh, it's been through many reviews and is considered stable. Yeah, and uh, the, the the list on the left hand side there is um, showing archetypes at the moment, and this this uh, site contains quite a few archetypes, and um, I think close to two hundred of them are are published with this little green tick. Um, there are a few templates there as well, but uh, not anywhere near as many as archetypes. And that's because in most cases, when we create functionality, um, the requirements are very local. Uh, so um, mo most of the uh, templates that are on this site are examples and not templates that are created for actual use. Uh, it's this little tab here that you can use mm. to find the templates. And then you can also adopt an archetype. If you're interested in blood pressure, for example, you can adopt it and then you get an email whenever something interesting happens to it, when it's time for a new review or someone has submitted a question or things like that. Yeah, and you can also submit uh, change requests. Uh, yes. If you show that little icon with, uh, with the um, 
these... uh, the bulleted list. Yeah. So uh, if you uh, look at an archetype and say, oh, this thing is missing or this thing is uh, wrong or whatever, you can submit a change request there. Yep. And this is the mind map is, uh, of course, just a visualization under the hood. You can get this out in different data formats uh, and it's based on an object oriented model. Uh, and in part two uh, of the tutorial that is not recorded here, but will be at Vitalis, we'll go through more of details like this. But just a repetition, you have the archetypes that we saw in the tool, right, in the CKM. You put them together into templates. And then once you have a template, you can do different things with it. You could, for example, pull it, pull the template into a UI tool where you can design a form form builder of some kind, and you can add some conditional logic. If they select A, then show question B and so on. And you can also use a template uh, to create queries if you want to query data. So there are query building tools and query display tools to make it easy to, to ask questions on data, either population data or individual patients. And you can export that in all kinds of formats. And once you've built a form, there are usually things like form renders that allow you, to, if you have a web application, you just tell the web application, use the form render and load it with this form, with this name and version. And then it takes care of everything and submitting the content via APIs to an open air backend. So this uh, ends our presentation here. And if you're at Vitalis, you're very welcome to the afternoon session where we go into much more detail for two hours uh, and look at different tools and other things. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.